What's up Thrashers and welcome back once again to the Thrash Maniac 99 YouTube channel and I am back with another CD collection update and we are finally getting into the run of updates where I'm going to be showing off everything I got on my trip to Toledo back in mid to late August uh, where I got to hang out with Nick and John from Thralls of Metal for a day. But also stopped at, I basically stopped at a shop or two every day I was on this trip. So there were two that I've gone to every single time I've gone up to Toledo over the past few years. Uh, both of them allied record exchanges up in like Toledo and the Mommy areas up in northern Ohio. Both great stores if you want to get CDs, DVDs, vinyl maybe even cassettes, and for some old video games. And then the other two places stopped at No Noise Records, which got some stuff from there. And then another place I went over near Sandusky and found a good amount of stuff. So yeah, awesome area to get music. If you're in the Toledo Sandusky area, stop at uh, Allied Record Exchange, both in Toledo and Maumee, uh, No Noise Records, and then the fourth place that was near Sandusky, I forget what it's called. I'll maybe have it in the description box for remembrance. But without further ado, let's go into this update. So, yeah, this is the first of three updates where it's all the stuff I got from Toledo. And without further ado, let's get started. First, we have... Um, blah, 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 blah. I can't even fucking speak. We have Abbath with their with his self-titled debut, Abbath. So yeah, self-titled debut 2016 for Abbath, for formerly of Immortal. Yeah, this was the first thing he did after the nasty split with Demon Oz from Immortal when the Immortal name was up for legal rights and stuff happens. So Abbath went in to form his own band and got his own musicians to come in and do his band, and this was the first thing that came out. And I remembered listening to this when it came out in 2016, I thought this was some really fun, riffy black metal, and of course, Abbath's vocals still, mm, still killed at this point. Maybe recently, not as strong, especially that last album, Dread Reaver, or Dreadweaver, whatever the hell that album was called. I wasn't a fan of the production on that album, nor his vocals. But this album, I thought was really good. Part of me likes this a little more than Outstrider, the second album that came out after this. But still, I mean, songs like To War, Winter Bane, uh, Fenrir Hunts, some cool stuff. Even a fun, goofy cover of Judas Priest Riding on the Wind shows up on here, too. It's not on the track listing on the back, but it's on here. And, yeah, hearing uh, Abbath do the uh, vocals on that cover was pretty interesting. But, yeah, Abbath's solo debut, I now have. <clears throat> Next, we have A Legion, Proponent for Sentience. This is the fourth, <coughs> excuse me, fourth studio album from this uh, Denver-based progressive slash technical slash melodic death metal band. It's basically a hodgepodge of prog, tech, and mellow death. And I think if I recall, I did review this when it came out, but it's been so long since that review happened and it wasn't very good. But yeah, this is a fantastic album. Then again... I think, I can't remember if it, if it was this or the previous album that came out in 2014. I'm pretty sure it was the one from 2014 where I first got into these guys. And I followed on every album since. Even their last one, Damn Them, I thought was brilliantly crafted. Honestly, that kind of sound, I think, started with this. Because this is where he started to hear a little more progressive death metal lenient stuff. As opposed to just straight up melodic tech death. You know, the three proponent for sentient songs. The Conception, uh, Apassionata, Ex Machiner. Or no, not that one, excuse me. Uh, the Algorithm and The Extermination. Those three songs connected together make for a really cool title track. But what's unique about this album is the closer is a pretty cool cover of Rush Subdivisions. And I think for that style, they do that cover pretty damn well. I know they did Yes Roundabout not too long after this, 
And if I recall, this was also, I believe, the first, this was either the first or the second album with then-vocalist Riley McShane, who I think was an amazing vocalist across the board in terms of screams, growls, and melodic singing. Kind of sucks he's not in the band anymore, but we'll see what happens with the Legion going forward whenever the next album comes out. But yeah, proponent for sentience. All right, and now we get to a pair, and we have a pair from Arch Enemy. We have their fourth album, Wages of Sin, and their sixth album, Doomsday Machine. So Arch Enemy has been a band that's kind of fallen out of the radar for me, mainly because I've been hesitant to check out anything new of theirs after War Eternal, just because it just feels like... Michael Amach is kind of stuck in a certain gear and isn't willing to let anybody else ride with him. So, yeah, they're kind of in a bit of a bind right now. But this is back in their glory years. Now, Wages of Sin, this was the first one to feature Angela Gossow on vocals after Johan Leva left. And this was a monstrous album. Tracks like Enemy Within, First Deadly Sin, Ravenous, Burning Angel... Savage Messiah, just killer songs across the board on this album and kicked off a new era for Arch Enemy and maybe, in my opinion, their best era, and this was really what kick-started it. Now, Doomsday Machine, this is where I would say this was the end of the glory days, in my opinion, for Arch Enemy because this was the end of that phenomenal run, and this album, Doomsday Machine... This was when I first heard of Arch Enemy. Not when it came out. This was 2005. I heard this stuff like a few years after. Songs like My Apocalypse and Nemesis being big ones that I still do enjoy if I'm in the mood for some Arch Enemy. But also tracks like Skeleton Dance, Mechanic God Creation, uh, Taking Back My Soul. There's just some nasty songs. And also both albums mixed by Andy Sneap but done with different production. Like here on Wages of Sin, it was Frederick Nordstrom. Here it was Richard Bingson. Bingson? I probably butchered that, but it's Richard or Rickard. I have no fucking clue. But either way, yeah, Andy Sneap mixed both of these albums, and these are two of the best Arch Enemy albums to have, so check them out if you have it. All right, and now these next three are all going to be from the same band, and that is Autopsy. First, we have Macabre Eternal. This was the fifth studio album from this legendary death metal band from California, Death Doom even. And this was their big comeback album after a long period of hiatus when, after Shit Fun came out, Autopsy split. And Chris and Danny went on to form Abscess. And after Abscess, it was around like the mid to late 2000s where there seemed to be this interest in Autopsy again when they reunited. Initially doing like reunion shows with Danny Lilker on bass in the beginning. But then the interest grew and it led to them deciding to come back and do music again. And this was the first studio full length since Shit Fun. So it was what... 16 years because this came out in 2011 and this was a nasty comeback album tracks like the title track seeds of the doomed born undead bridge of bones dirty gore horde like again the song titles and the lyrics are still killer and chris reiford showed that hey i still have what it takes to make some killer fucking music all these years later and yeah this was a hell of a comeback and then we get the follow-up the Headless Ritual, which was 2013, and this one I only checked out briefly, but from what I heard on here, it is fantastic. I mean, like, She is a Funeral, When Hammer Meets Bone, uh, Mangled Far Below, just some more cool song titles and lyrics. Now, one thing I will say that this album, I think, suffers from in comparison to Macabre Eternal the production's not as strong on this album as I would like it to be, but the vocals, I think, are a lot more chaotic, and I absolutely love that about this album, so 
<clears throat> yeah, kind of a good trade-off, I would say. I would say the vocals were better on here, but the production was a little bit better on Macabre Eternal. But still, really killer album, continuing the awesome comeback run of Autopsy. And then we get Skull Grinder, which it's very conflicting as to whether or not people view this as a full length or an EP. I think it's an EP because it's like under 25 minutes. Yeah, there's seven tracks, but they're all really short. But this is still a really fun, I'm just going to call it an EP, a fun EP with the title track, Children of the Filth, The Withering Death. Again, just cool songs. Again, during an era for Autopsy where it's like we're trying to get back into the public eye and get recognized again for our greatness. <clears throat> and this EP, this is the last thing they did up until they came back with Morbidity Triumphant a couple of years ago. And that, as well as Ashes, Organ, Blood, and Crips, amazing duality of nastiness. So, yeah, autopsy stuff, more in the collection. I still need to get uh, Acts of the Unspeakable and maybe another EP or two, and then I'd have everything I'd want from Autopsy because I'm not the biggest fan of shit fun. But that's just me. But yeah, Skull Grinder. All right, and next up we have Arion, The Human Equation. This is the classic duality concept album from Arjun Anthony Lucasen, who's a Dutch musician, great guitarist and singer, songwriter extraordinaire. I've been meaning to get into Arion more. Like, I've heard songs here and there or parts of songs here and there, but this was the album I heard so many people, like, give high praise to. And I can see why, because it's an awesome concept all about, uh, uh, I think, like, a kid's life going through, like, pain and doing, like, mystery stuff, like going to school, the playground, some love, fear. And also what's really cool is a lot of guest stars on here. Like, the primary writers are Arjun and Ed Warby, who is also the drummer of Gorefest and Hail of Bullets. Um... It's mainly them two doing the songwriting, but you have guest musicians, the most notable ones, Irene Jansen, the younger sister of current Nightwish front woman, Floor Jansen, but you also have Devin Townsend, James Labrie, and Michael Ockerfeld. So you had some really cool guest vocalists on here that kind of helped add to the story, the, to the concept of this album. And this is fantastic, progressive metal, progressive rock. And watching the behind the scenes, especially with Michael Ockerfeld in the studio, where Arjun wasn't the biggest fan of like growling vocals, but when he heard Michael's clean vocals, he's like, man, this dude sounds great. But then whenever he had Michael play the character Fear in the story, he's like, how about do a couple of growling lines and see how that fits? And it fit perfectly with the character that Michael portrayed. So yeah. Arion, The Human Equation, awesome Dutch prog rock metal glory. All right, next up we have Benediction, Scriptures. This is the eighth and latest fooling from this British death metal legend. I mean, Benediction's another one of those bands that I've been needing to kind of dive further into. I've been listening to more songs, particularly from their early days, recently but i picked up this because i was like well i need benediction this is some really cool old school death metal like very double time very groovy even some thrashy nods but uh, what was really cool was i believe it's the track progenitors of a new paradigm featuring one cam lee from massacre excuse me doing guest vocals on that song but there's other killer tracks on here too like storm crow embrace the kill in our hand the scars rabid carn uh carnality i think i got that right carnality just again fun nasty old school death metal from these nasty old school death metalers from the uk all right next up black breath sentence to life this is the second full length from this uh, Washington, I think Seattle-based. Oh man, how to describe them, at least early on, especially here. I'd say 
their mixture of like crossover thrash, crust punk, hardcore, black metal, and death metal. It, it's hard to really describe, but it's a band from Seattle that play with the boss HM2 tone, so it obviously gives it that like Swedish death metal feel. And there's a lot of death metal on here, but there's also a lot of like hardcore and a little bit of crossover thrash, a little crust, a little black metal in here. But I got turned on to this album courtesy of Necrotic Nick when I met him last year, uh, met him in person for the first time. He played me stuff off of this, and I'm like, dude, this is killer. Because I had only heard snippets from their last album, Slaves Beyond Death, which came out in 2015, and that was the last thing Black Breath did. And that was definitely more of a death metal album than what this was. This, I just heard this, like, the first couple of tracks, and I'm like, dude, this fucking rips. Couldn't find a copy to save my life until finding it at one of them shops, and I'm like, dude, hell yes. But yeah, this is just some awesome death metal, hardcore, black metal, crossover, crust, whatever. It's nasty and awesome. Check it out if you haven't. All right, next up we get into some Blue Oyster Cult, Tyranny and Mutation. This is the second full length from this long-standing classic rock, hard rock, prog rock, proto-metal band. And this album's kind of interesting because, yeah, it follows the debut. And I would say, personally, might have been a slight step up from the debut, maybe in terms of songwriting, but maybe in the production, still needing to work some kinks out, but some cool tracks on here like The Red and the Black, uh, Baby Ice Dog, Wings Wetted Down, uh, Mistress of the Salmon Salt, Quick Lime Girl, weird, weird song title I gotta admit, but yeah, basically, yeah, this was still during that era where Blue Oyster Cold was given the tag of being known as the American Black Sabbath, which was pretty accurate for the 70s, like the early 70s material up to, up to here, and I think maybe even um, Secret Treaties, I think, was the album, I forget, but yeah, still very much kind of in that, like, bluesy, proto-metal vibe, but still kind of incorporating like folk rock harmonies on here. And I am reading some of that from the back of this album just for remembrance. But yeah, some really cool stuff right here. So kind of an early metal album or proto-metal album for here in America because we didn't really have heavy metal here in America quite just yet. But yeah, Blue Oyster Cult. All right, and now next up we get Children of Bodom with Hate Crew Death Roll. This is the fourth studio album from this legendary Finnish melodic death metal band, and a band that's sorely missed. Well, particularly because we lost Alexi Laiho back in 2020. Still can't believe that. But yeah, this is the fourth album from Children of Bodom, and this was considered by many at this point their last like truly amazing album before they kind of tapered off for the next about 10 years it wasn't until they got to halo of blood in 2013 where things started to come back to where they were back in their early days but yeah needle 24 7 classic song triple corpse hammer blow the title track uh six pounder just again some awesome mellow death that has some like power metal and black metal and thrash metal lenience but yeah this kind of this band really i think kind of kick-started the modern mellow death movement in finland that would be picked up on by bands like kalma bellacor insomnium omnium gatherum except this band was a little more aggressive than most of those but yeah children of bodem all right, and next up we have Converge, Jane Doe. This is the fourth studio album from this Massachusetts-based hardcore slash metalcore legendary band. This is a band that I've always had difficulty getting into, mainly because I'm not the world's biggest fan of Jacob Banyan's vocals, but the music is absolutely furious on here, like Concubine, Homewrecker, Hell to Pay, uh, bitter and then some 
just nasty songs that's just super heavy for a metalcore band slash uh, metallic hardcore band. And this is where some people would even call them a mathcore band because there are songs on here where they just go absolutely bonkers with time changes and just weird song arrangements. And again, just embracing the chaos. Even though, you know, you had bands like Botch, Coalesce, and Dillinger Escape Plan doing that style a little bit before this album, this album, I think, was what kind of made Mathcore a known thing. And then Mathcore, in my opinion, died years ago, <laughs> but that's just me. But yeah, Converge, Jane Doe, it's seen as like one of the classic metalcore albums, especially the early 2000s period when metalcore started to shift away from being all about, you know, like straight up hardcore meets metal and being more like hardcore meets melodic death metal and thrash. So yeah, this was kind of an interesting album during an interesting period. So yeah, Converge, Jane Doe. All right, and then these next two are from Crowbar. We have their third album, Time Heals Nothing, and their 10th album, Symmetry in Black. Two completely different periods for Crowbar. With Time Heals Nothing, this came out in 1994, and this was still in that early period for Crowbar where they were still kind of figuring out their sound a little bit and into becoming one of the legendary pioneers of sludge metal. And this album, while I still need to get the first two, the uh, Obedience or Suffering and the self-titled, this, I think, is a good continuation from the self-titled. Granted, maybe a little quieter mix, but some killer tracks like Embracing Emptiness, the title track, and Through a Wall of Tears. Just nasty, depressing, heavy, sludgy, doomy shit. I mean, Kirk Winstein's a riff lord. We all know that. Now, Symmetry in Black... <clears throat> Excuse me, I will say, like, this is definitely during the more modern era of Crowbar, and this came out in 2014. So, yeah, 20 year difference between these two albums. But this album, I honestly do agree, it's kind of a deep cut from the Crowbar discography because it doesn't get talked about as much compared to. <gasps> Excuse me to some of their older albums, but still you got some cool tracks on here like Ageless Decay, The Foreboding in particular. Just walk, uh, walk Wisely, or Walk With Knowledge Wisely. Like, those songs just continue showcasing that Crowbar can still write killer stuff. And it almost has a little bit of like an Alice in Chains meets Down vibe at times. And I would even say like some Alice in Chains moments may pop up a little bit on Time Heals Nothing. But with Symmetry in Black, definitely has a little bit of Down vibes to it. Like some songs do kind of bring out a little bit of positivity, mainly like Symmetry in White. I would say is like the one song where it kind of has that a little bit, but it's still very somber for the most part. But yeah, two vastly different albums from Crowbar, but I'm glad to have them. And then the final album, we have Death Spell Omega with Fast It Maledicti in Igna Maternum. This is the fourth or the fifth studio album, I think, from this French avant-garde slash... I guess technical black metal band. It's kind of hard to describe, but yeah, and not going into the controversies with Miko Aspa because we'd be here forever, but just judging by the music, this is some wild, chaotic shit right here. And I know I've become a giant fan of Ulcerate over the past year or so, and I figured maybe I should check out bands that are comparable to ulcerate and see kind of like where ulcerate got a little bit of their sound from i would argue death spell omega is one of those bands ulcerate got a little bit of their influence from because this is just dissonant chaotic brutal although in comparison to ulcerate this is a little different in the sense that there's some like jazz fusion moments that show up in death spell omega where in Ulcerate, it's not as much. I would say Ulcerate focuses a little more on, like, 
post-metal atmospherics rather than jazz fusion like Death Spell does. But musically, there are some similarities in terms of technicality and dissonance and chaos. The main difference being Death Spell plays it in a black metal way, where Ulcerate do it in a death metal way. But yeah, this album, it's just absolutely freaking bonkers. It doesn't have the song titles on here, but like, Bread of Bitterness. That was, I think, the first Death Spell Omega song I actually heard anything from. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck is this? It just sounds like five metal bands playing all at once. But it was kind of cool to hear that. Now again, not going to get into the Miko Aspa stuff. In fact, he, he ain't really writing many lyrics. Oh no, the song titles are on here. You have Bread of Bitterness. Uh, let's see, I can't even... Some of these titles are like written weird. Oh, The Shrine of Mad Laughter. That was the other one. I'm like, man, this is some nasty, dissonant stuff. But yeah, if you are a fan of... You know, Blue Doss Nord, Ulcerate, Later Gorguts, Imperial Triumphant. Then, if you can put your opinions aside about Miko Aspa and just focus on the music, separate the artist from the art, I think you will dig this. This is some nasty, nasty stuff. And that does it for this first update of three for the Toledo trip. Uh, I don't know when the other two parts will come out. Uh, but I'm glad I got this one out of the way, and yeah, I got a shit ton of stuff from Toledo that I'll be going through here pretty soon, but anyways, what's your guys' favorite album out of this particular stack for this time around? A couple more updates still to come from Toledo, and I'm sure those opinions might change about your favorite out of anything I got from that trip. But anyways, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Keep your horns high and your dreams wet. Thank you for your patronage.